Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Apologies for the slight uh, delay in starting. My name is Noha al -Mikawi. I am the Dean of the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy here at the American University in Cairo. Very happy to have you all in the room. Um, great to have our president, Dr. Ahmed Dallal, in the room, our provost, Dr. Ihab Abdurrahman. Um, our board of trustees members are with us in the room. His Excellency Amru Musa is with us in the room. Thank you very much for honoring us with your presence. Um, I am particularly honored and pleased to present to you a panel of the highest caliber uh, that our Arab region can offer. I'm very honored to welcome His Excellency Dr. Nabil Fahmi, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt, former Egyptian ambassador to Washington DC, Dean Emeritus of the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at AUC, um, and its founding dean, founding dean of the school in 2009, as well as the founder of this fantastic series of Tahrir Dialogues um, and the AUC journal um, <coughs> called Cairo Review of Global Affairs, which is an influential journal by now on the global scene. Um, I'm also extremely honored to be able to present to you His Excellency Dr. Marwan Masher, Vice President for Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Jordan, former Deputy Prime Minister of Jordan, and he also served as a Jordanian Ambassador to the USA. And last by, but by no means least, uh, uh, Dr. Nassif Hetti. Honored to have you here with us, sir. Senior Advisor to the Arab and International Affairs Program at Aysan Faris University, uh, Aysan Faris Institute at the American University in Beirut, former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Lebanon, and a Professor of International Relations and Middle Eastern Studies, as well as former Ambassador, Head of Mission of the League of Arab States uh, to Italy, the Holy See, and France, League of Arab States, permanent observer to the UN, um, organizations in Rome, and permanent observer to UNESCO, among many other things that all three excellencies have done in their lives. Um, and you cannot put together such a panel um, without um, bringing to lead a conversation someone of equally distinguished career, and that is our moderator of the day, uh, professor of, Glo uh, of Practice of Global Affairs and Distinguished Political Analyst, Dr. Ibrahim Awad, who is also the Director of the Center for Migration and Refugee Studies here at the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Um, what are all these brilliant minds gonna discuss with us today? I would say a very timely and a very important subject matter. Um, Difficult to frame the situation that we will be talking with them about today, but let me try to summarize some of its broad uh, uh, features. The Arab region is living a moment of deep reckoning and, trans and transformation. Since the conflict erupted in Gaza, everyone expressed shock at the levels of atrocity and many harbored deep concerns about the prospect of the conflict spreading beyond Gaza. Today, we see a humanitarian crisis of deplorable magnitude, international law violations that are yet to be accounted for, and the conflict has spread beyond Gaza. The Israeli insistence on carrying on with the fight in Gaza and not rigorously stopping the escalation of violence in the West Bank are putting unprecedented pressure on Egypt's and Jordan's peace agreements. The international community is rising up against the impunity of Israel, the nature of Israel's future state, and the nature of future Palestinian governance. These are also being discussed. 
while the unwavering Western support for Israel's claim of self-defense is increasingly coming under heavy legal and political scrutiny. And all this is happening while the media arsenal of weapons of mass distraction and disinformation have fueled international conversations about the Palestinian cause. Never before has that sympathy as well as conversation about that cause been as it is today in the last 75 years. What does this all tell us? It raises some immediate questions. Can we stop the conflict now to end human suffering in the region? And is there any role for diplomacy or the further militarization of the context is unstoppable? The situation also has longer term strategic concerns and questions. How to build a new Arab regional framework of security that manages non-Arab actors and addresses the notion and the infrastructure of resistance? Is there a chance for a just and enduring end game? And finally, is that all possible without reforming the international system and strengthening international law? Huge set of questions. I'm not quite sure we will be able to finish answering them today, but I cannot think of a better panel of distinguished and principled minds and hearts to discuss those questions today than the panel we have assembled for you. Um, we have about 45 participants with us online, and I turn it now over to Professor Ibrahim Awad to kick off the conversation. Over to you, sir. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very much, Dinoa, for, for the introduction, for introducing our three distinguished panelists, for introducing me. Let me just say to those who are joining us online that um, any, any question that they may have at the end of the talks, um, they could just send them um, through uh, the chat function in, in Zoom. Apart from that, I reiterate my Welcome to those all uh, to all those here present, and without that much uh, uh, elaboration, without uh, further ado, I have a first question. Um, in the light of the framing of the situation in the region, the situation that arose after the seventh of October. Uh, my first question is to Marwan Lemasher. Why has the first, the 7th of October taken place? Where does this operation on the 7th of October come from? What is the origin? Uh, for some, President Biden, other Western leaders uh, reacted uh, immediately after the 7th of October uh, saying that we should have a two-state solution. Uh, implicitly, this was a recognition that it was occupation at the origin of what happened, and even more than occupation. But Israel was not in agreement with that. Israel thought that occupation and security and peace could be achieved together. What do you think? Thank you, Dr. Brahim. It's actually, the, the world acted surprised uh, that October 7 took place. And frankly, I'm surprised why the world was surprised. You lock people up in a huge prison called Gaza for 17 years without the ability to go in and out except with Israel's permission. You don't allow them to have a seaport. You don't allow them to have an airport. You don't give them a political horizon that there is any end to the occupation any time. And then you're surprised when they don't act nicely. The focus of the international community has been on what happened in October 7. But it's, of course, the wrong focus, in my view. 
the focus should have always been on the core problem, which is the occupation. The occupation, not just of Gaza, but of the whole West Bank and East Jerusalem, has been going on for 57 years. There is no longer occupation in the whole world. There was no political horizon, there was no political process for the last 10 years uh, when John Kerry had his last attempt at uh, trying to find a solution. And frankly, it is not surprising. What is surprising in my view, and I'm not talking about the you know, killing of civilians which, which cannot be condoned on both sides, but it shouldn't be surprising that October 7 took place. What, what should be surprising is that it took so long to take place. The two-state solution that Dr. Brahim is talking about has become an empty slogan. The international community has raised the slogan for far too many times, for far too many years, without accompanying it with a plan to make it happen. And in the meantime, Israel was building more settlements and killing the very two-state solution that we are all you know, uh, 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 committed to. If you allow me, uh, you know, uh, a short joke, it's like two people arguing over a slice of pizza while one of them is eating it. It doesn't work. And people in the end, you know, realize that. That uh, it is not surprising today, after October 7, that 64% of Palestinians according to the last poll done after October 7, 64% of Palestinians now believe the only way to end the occupation is through armed resistance. That's a number that has never been so high, never been so high. It was always in the 20s, uh, more or less. But that tells you the amount of despair that people have reached uh, because of the lack of a political horizon. If, if I have two more minutes, I want to talk about the two-state solution again. Today we are hearing President Biden and others repeat the slogan once again, to, you know, a commitment to two-state solution. I'm among the people who have worked all their political career uh, on a two-state solution, but I do not think it is possible anymore. But I, I'm willing to, you know, engage in the argument of, okay, if we want to talk about a two-state solution from now on, let us look at the conditions necessary to implement that two-state solution and not be fooled once again by uh, supporting a slogan that has no content. The most important shortcoming of almost all political processes in the past to arrive at a solution has been that an end game has never been defined. People were negotiating. Oslo is a prime example of this. Oslo was a process in which the two parties were supposed to negotiate for five years to arrive at a solution. Oslo never talked about a two-state solution. It was the Arab and Palestinian and maybe international community hope that Oslo would end in a two-state solution. Israel never committed to ending the occupation and to a two-state solution. And so any, from now on, in my view, any serious process has to have the following conditions. One. A Palestinian state needs to be recognized by the UN on the basis of the 67 borders, a priori, before con negotiations start. If the United States is to lead a process, it has to define the end game, and the end game needs to be defined as the end of the occupation within a specified time frame. 
three years, four years, five years. Three, settlement activity has to stop completely. No ifs, buts, or whatever. If these conditions are put forward and agreed to, then negotiations might start. And then they become over steps to reach that end game rather than negotiations over the end game itself. But I ask all of you, who among you thinks today that the United States is able, willing to conduct such a process in a presidential year? Who among you thinks today that Israel is prepared to end the occupation? Netanyahu just said it yesterday, no. No to uh, uh, any uh, unilateral, he called it. Uh, uh. And the Palestinians today, can Abu Mazen sign on behalf of the Palestinians when less than 10% support him, according to the latest poll? The stars are not aligned for a political solution. And I haven't even mentioned the demographics. 750,000 settlers in the West Bank and East Jerusalem today, comprising about 25% of the population there. Who is going to separate these two communities to make a two-state solution possible? My fear, my, my biggest fear, is that Israel's real aim behind the war on Gaza is not simply to destroy Hamas military capability, but to affect a mass transfer of Palestinians. Because it's the only logical solution from Israel's point of view. If the Israelis don't want to end the occupation and establish a Palestinian state, and they also don't want a Palestinian majority in areas under their control. And today, the Palestinians are a majority already. 7.4 million Palestinian Arabs compared to 7.2 million Israeli Jews in areas under Israel's control. If Israel does not want either a state or a majority of Palestinians, the only logical solution is for Israel to affect a mass transfer of Palestinians of Gazans into Egypt and West Bankers into Jordan. And I strongly believe, and I've been saying this for years, this is what we have to guard against. Emptying Palestinian land of its citizens and solving the issue at Jordan and Egypt's expense. That's where we are uh, going. If, if Israel does not succeed at mass transfer. And if there is no political solution, as I believe there isn't any, any short-term one, I think the most likely scenario, whether we like it or not, is a different issue. The most likely scenario is a continuation of violence, both in the West Bank and in Gaza, while the demographics present themselves. Every Palestinian woman today, on average, brings to the world 4.1 children. Every Israeli woman, on average, brings to the world 3.1 children. So we don't only have a majority of Palestinians, it is an increasing majority. And in 10 or 15 or 20 years' time, when it becomes possible, as I think it will, when it becomes clear that there is no two-state solution, the world will have to deal in 20 years' time, not with occupation, but with apartheid. And the issue is going to shift from focusing on the shape of a solution to focusing on equal rights. Because the Palestinians are not going to accept living under occupation indefinitely. And if it becomes clear to them that there is not going to be a Palestinian state, the only recourse they have is to call for equal rights where they live. That is not a call to abandon the Palestinian national identity and immerse itself in the Israeli one. Absolutely not. South Africa 
when it abandoned apartheid, the, the blacks did not immerse into the white culture. They formed a new state where all its citizens live under equal rights. And I believe that this is the more likely scenario to where we are heading. I do not believe that talk about a two-state solution has degenerated into giving an excuse for Israel to build more settlements, to buy more time, and to kill that very solution that we talk about. That's where I think things are heading. Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very elaborate uh, answer to the question. Uh, I'd like I, I'm lucky to, to moderate um, uh, a panel with very good uh, close and, and old friends, and that's why I, I'll, my question will be, next question will be to, to Nasif, in fact. Nasif, Marwan Le Masher said that the two-state solution is not realistic any longer, it cannot be expected any, any longer. And he talked about the design of Israel of transferring Palestinians from Gaza. And he talked about apartheid 20 years from now. Many people, President Carter, talked about apartheid 10 years ago. Uh, you are very familiar with French politics. Dominique de Villepin, in fact, talked about the transfer of the settlers back into Israel of the borders of 1948. What do you make out of transfer and transfer and apartheid and, and two-state solution? Is it possible? Is it not? What do you make out of this? You have been your entire life, professional life, was in the League of Arab States and, and foreign minister of Lebanon. So you're very familiar with all these questions. What do you think? Well, let me say first, I mean, the basic problem in being in Arab politics in general was this total divorce between adopting a position and not formulating policies to apply uh, and turn these positions into practical policies, not investing in these matters. That's a basic trait symptom, actually, that we faced up to all the time. This is why I fall in what I called uh, a diplomacy of schizophrenia, which makes us lose all kind of credibility, all kind of credibility at, at, at all levels. I, I still believe, uh, and I would disagree with my friend Marwan, that it's uh, true today is very difficult to, to establish the two-state solution, but at the end of the day, this is the only possible solution because the one-state solution in Israel is based on the concept of a democracy for the Jews, not based on the concept of citizenship, secular citizenship, let me say, regardless of who we belong to. And we could bring perhaps in the future that could happen, but I think if we move along the lines of what you call reverse engineering, committing ourselves, the international community, the countries, the basic powers that would like to find a solution, not only adjourning a solution where situation becomes much more difficult over time, not going into a ceasefire, and actually today, Israel and most Western countries are against ceasefire. Even Western countries don't support ceasefire. What they call humanitarian truce or a new concept, humanitarian pause, just to give a break and go back in, into fighting, uh, which is preparing, in a way, what you mentioned, Marwan, a second Nakba, but also a second transfer in, in, in all direction. What we have been seeing for, for all those years are two things. The, you know, de-Palestinization of the demography and de-Palestinization also of the geography, at least in the West Bank, and now it's coming in, 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 in Gaza. Having said so, I still believe uh, if we reach a ceasefire, it'll be, even if we reach a ceasefire, it'll be adjourning the conflict, the explosion to come later on. No Palestinians would accept at the end of the day to live under the old South African kind of regime. So what's needed really is what I call a reverse engineering, a, a serious commitment, not a verbal commitment. I don't know when it come, how could it come, to a two-state solution, and then negotiations will have to move along that within very well decided timetable. A bit flexible, but decided timetable. If you ask me, it's not for today, but each day that goes by, we'll be having more and more uh, problems occurring. 
Last point, if I may add something here, we have what you call the unity of the old France, one of the Sahad in Arabic today, and government totally today is connected to what's going on in Gaza. I wouldn't exclude tomorrow a third Antifada in the West Bank and more tension on the border. So what we're discussing now, if I may use a moment for that in Lebanon, what the Israelis are asking for is impossible to say. An application, an implementation of the 1701, UN Security Council, Resolution 1701, the way they would see it, what we, most Lebanese, officially at least, and unofficially are asking for, is a more balanced, more symmetrical situation about that matter. About that matter, starting with negotiations that are on a ceasefire, a real ceasefire, but starting after with negotiations about confirming we don't have to trace new borders. Our borders have only certain points of, you know, uh, how to put it, uh, differences concerning uh, what was the armistice line since the establishment of the state of Israel, plus the Sheba Farm, the Sheba Farm, there is a debate that are now under the 242 resolution, it's for the Syrians to move them to Lebanon to become under the 45 resolution. But would remember uh, in, uh, in the summer of 2006, there was an idea presented at that time by the government of Watsanura to put that under the UN control. So to address all the potential problems that could not allow, that could be used and misused not to, not to make peace. We're directly connected, of course, to the situation on Palestinian territories, but that's also an important point that you must take into consideration. What scares me is an Israeli policy that feeds into radicalism, that might feed into a war of gods, because what we're seeing today, the government of Israel is fighting in the name of Allah, its own way, basically. Those who are in government, that could provoke the opposite, and extremism is the objective ally of extremism. They speak the same language in a zero-sum game. And that's a major source of concern, at least if I may answer first on that point. Thank you very much for, for a picture that you painted that is not uh, much more optimistic than that of, uh, of Marwan Namashir, but uh, something must happen. The, the hostilities must come to an end, the active hostilities at, at, at least. But of course you said, and I think rightly so, and Marwan Marshall has also said that if there is a ceasefire, but not a solution, you will have another explosion down the line. And the next explosion may be even more destructive and, and, more, and more violent. So my question to, to, to Nabil Fahmi, uh, Nabil, can you imagine a temporary solution and a long-term solution? Is that possible? Or do we have to move directly to the solution? And is it possible? Thank you, Brave. <clears throat> Dr. Kerry, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always uh, very uh, pleasant for me to come back to AUC, not only meet old friends and colleagues, but also I'm an alumni, an undergraduate and graduate here, so a lot of warm sentiments here, but so thank you, Noah. I regret the, the occasion is a very pessimistic one, but I'll address the question nevertheless. Uh, I don't think the issue is short-term or long-term. We can't afford not to deal with the crisis, and it would be worth a, completely a waste of time not to deal with the problem. So we need to find a way to deal with the crisis and with the problem at the same time. Now, you're not going to be able to do all of that at the same time. So what we need to do is actually put the elements of dealing with the crisis and with the problem under one umbrella. Uh, I don't want to say an umbrella for a process, but an umbrella for specific targets. And let me just mention a couple of them, and if I miss uh, one or two, uh, I'll try to get back. To them. There's no question one has to have a ceasefire. What we're facing in the region today is a cacophony of conflict and a carnage of inhumanity. Allow this to continue is simply immoral and unacceptable for any human being. So you need to have uh, a ceasefire. There is a very strong demand for a hostage versus uh, the Palestinians incarcerated exchange. That's going to be, have to be part of whatever way we move forward. Uh, 
both of them, whether you're talking to the Palestinians, Hamas or otherwise, or whether you're talking to the Israelis, neither of them are going to move without uh, the other. Uh, my colleagues on the left and on the right, of course, raised an, a lot, number of points which will explain to you why I'm making a couple of more. Uh, there will have to be sustained uh, refurbishment of the human facilities in Gaza and providing assistance. That has to come almost immediately at the same time. Fourthly, you're going to have to have a withdrawal of Israeli forces because you can't have a withdrawal of Israeli forces and expect the two sides to remain smiling at each other and acting peacefully. Now, uh, if you start with the hostages, Hamas will say no. If you start with the withdrawal, Israel says no. And I can go on and on with, with this list. But let me then add to that uh, a point that Marwan very correctly mentioned. I think the three of us here have probably done about 70 years of peacemaking, and our uh, report card is not a very good one, regrettably. Uh, but the reality is, whenever we speak today about a peace process, we get laughed off the podium. I was speaking at the Egyptian press syndicate a couple of days ago, and the minute I said peace process, I could see the smirks on their, on their faces, understandably so. Not because they were against peace, but because we failed so many times and there's no basis for this. It takes so long, the, the, the context changes and the people change. But anyway, <clears throat> therefore, things have to come as a package up front. The idea that a Palestinian state will be recognized when it's all resolved doesn't work. It's not going to be a functional <clears throat> answer. It won't be attractive to anybody. Uh, and what I would a little bit tinker with and, and what Marwan said, it's not enough for me for the UN to recognize a Palestinian state. I want the nation states to recognize a Palestinian state. I don't want somebody to come and tell me, well, the UN did it, but I, vo I abstained. Or I voted no. No, no, no. If you're going to say you support a two-state solution, come out and say it. Say it's, do, or, or don't you recognize Israel? I mean, if you don't agree to either side of that bargain, that's a different discussion. But since you recognize Israel, then at, say you recognize a Palestinian state based on 1967. Now, the details of that will have to be negotiated. But if, if we want to be able to shift the anger and the sense of revenge on the Palestinian and Israeli side from that sense of frustration <clears throat> to a solution, you have to give them hope towards the future. And the hope towards the future essentially means that they see the end of this conflict. Can we negotiate end of the conflict in the next six months? No. But can we at least define it as an international community? And can we as nation states be clear in that process? I definitely believe we can. Uh, with all due respect, uh, it's not enough for me for a government to, I was just in a, in a meeting two days ago in Moscow and I met some foreign ambassadors and one of them said, well, we agree to a Palestinian state but we don't have provided it to the Palestinians as an incentive now. I was about to leave the table, frankly. Uh, if that's the approach, then it shows you, frankly, why the Palestinians can get angrier and angrier and why with an asymmetric balance of power, they will then use whatever for element and, and tools they have in their hands to try to express themselves. But anyway, so recognition of Palestinian state is important. Uh, a withdrawal of Israeli forces somewhere in that package is imperative because that re reflects uh, when you need to, to reduce the friction. I would also argue, frankly, that if we put these elements together, uh, it's important for the Arab Peace Initiative to be reaffirmed as well. Not renegotiated, simply reaffirmed. Because the Arab Peace Initiative actually says, if the occupation ends from all Arab territories, we should have normal relations with everybody, which of course includes uh, the Israelis. Uh, there will have to be, and I skipped this point, there will have to be a major uh, international effort 
to provide assistance to the Palestinians to rebuild what has been. And it's not, don't go to the Arab Gulf states and say, use the ATM machine. That's frankly really undignified. If you want them to help, everybody has to put some money up front as well. And I want to throw out another element which I really find, uh, two elements which I find regrettable. We have to once again highlight the importance of respecting the rule of law in relations between states. If we allow any side to base their actions on the balance of power rather than on the rule of law, we will end up with a shifting context all the time <clears throat> and which will ultimately also uh, lead to uh, major uh, friction in the future. The last point is there has to be accountability for actions. I would like to see these elements, and each one of them can be developed a little bit uh, in time, but I'd like to see a, an umbrella, political umbrella, for these elements, setting the targets it, clearly. I mean, this, these should be annotated elements, not wish lists. Uh, and have them adopted, preferably by the Security Council, over and above what each nation state has to do. Because that way, it provides a context that is as close as you can to being mandatory for all states. And if you add to them the issue of accountability and the rule of law, then you give them also a, a more support. I want to make one point, which is going to be a bit provocative. The United States is no longer capable to be the only broker for peace in the Middle East. It can't do it politically. It doesn't have the credibility to do it with anybody in the region. Even your strongest ally is ignoring what you're saying, basing his argument on that you don't have the political courage to follow through with your requests and hold me accountable when I ignore it. The US is extremely important in the political game and we will not reach a solution without it. But I think, frankly, one of our major mistakes over the years has been moving the context of the peace process from not the multilateral UN system, but yes, the UN system, where you have three or four sponsors for this process, so that we benefit from the US, we benefit from the EU, we benefit from uh, what is now Ru Russia, but don't burden any one of them with more than they can actually cope with. Uh, let me sort of stop with these points. I would simply conclude by saying <clears throat> we are between what Marwan correctly said is almost an implaus implausible uh, option, which is the two-state two solution. And another one, which is a, a recipe for continuous conflict. There's not going to be any time in our generation a one state on the land of Palestine where Palestinians and Israelis are treated equally. And unless they are, and both sides can claim that they have identity to that particular venue, uh, there will going to be conflict. And the conflict, while it becomes hot and, and cold at different times, it will not go away. Again, we can go on and on and argue, well, this point in time we felt Palestine wasn't an issue, then it became an issue. Now we're arguing that, well, the Red Sea is caused by Palestine, What's happening on this board in Iraq is caused by Palestine. The Houthis are being generated by Palestine. This is a problem we need to fix and to achieve peace between Arabs and Israelis based on the rule of law. There's no other option. So let's link the crisis to the resolution of the conflict under one umbrella with clear commitments from the beginning, irrespective of how long it takes us to actually implement that. But it should be time framed as well. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Nabi. Thank you very much. Uh, you're absolutely correct in, in linking the crisis to the origin, the root of, of the problem. And I think that personally, I think that the root of the problem cannot be addressed without the crisis and vice versa. 
you got the crisis without the root of the problem. Now, you agreed with Marwan Lamashir, even if you use different terms. He talked about a priori parameters, and you talked about uh, upfront package. Uh, now, you also talked about recognition of a Palestinian state. You are not content with the recognition through a United Nations General Assembly resolution. You want the recognition by nation states, bilateral. Uh, I imagine that if you have a very large majority of nation states recognizing the Palestinian states, a refusal by the United States to allow its entry to the United Nations would really be extremely weak in the international system because, after all, the international system is not the United Nations. The United Nations, the United Nations is much larger. So my question to, to Marwan Lemarshir is, is the following. Do you, agree, do you think that recognition of a Palestinian state by a very large majority of the members of the international system, would it facilitate negotiations for a long-term solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict? And what, what Nabil said, and I think he, he, to me, very rightly said it, that the United States should not be burdened to be the only, the only mediator to reach a solution. Would you think, would you agree with what Nabil said? And what are these, these how would the recognition facilitate the process of negotiation? As we speak, there is an effort behind closed doors so far by a number of countries. The United States is among them. Qatar, Egypt, Jordan, Britain, and others to recognize a Palestinian state, which triggered Netanyahu's comment yesterday. He said, we don't accept any unilateral moves, etc. I mean, that didn't come out of the blue. That came because the United States is uh, moving in that direction. Is it enough? No, in my view. It has to be recognition of a state has to be coupled with subs you know, subsequent steps to implement it. Otherwise, it's a, it's a necessary move, but it's not a sufficient move. Gideon Levy, one of uh, Israel's most respected journalists and most critical uh, of Israeli policy also, wrote an article yesterday in Haaretz in which he said, we in Israel are never going to accept an end to the occupation. Therefore, if we want a solution, and he obviously does want a solution, it has to be imposed on us. It has to be forced on us. Because unless it is forced on us, we will never accept a Palestinian state. I agree with his analysis. The question is, who is going to force it? Who is going to force it? It's not the UN, and I don't think it is the United States. And so, we're back to square one. Netanyahu has no intention to end this war anytime soon because it will be the end of his career once he does that. And so again, we are back to uh, uh, to discussing a situation where the end, the, 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 the short term end game, ending the war on Gaza, I think is not in sight. Uh, I agree with Nabil. Yes, I mean, uh, uh, recognition by a large number of states is, is certainly useful. I mean, the, in the EU, I mean, Sweden has already done it. Uh, Spain is seriously thinking of doing it. France also. Uh, David Cameron came up, you know, a few days ago and said that Britain is thinking of the same. So, 
And if the United States says, says it, it's, you know, it, it's a huge step, but it is not enough. It has to be coupled with a serious process. I, unfortunately, am not optimistic about the serious process. And therefore, I think in the end, all these steps are useful. But if nobody is willing to force Israel to end an illegal occupation, if nobody is willing to do that, and I don't see anybody willing to do that now, then I'm afraid the, 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 the conflict will continue. Uh, Nasif talked about a third intifada. Guys, the third intifada has already started. We are not waiting for it. Let's remember uh, violence in the West Bank started months before the war in Gaza. Months before. But this time, it is different than the first two intifadas. The first intifada was led by Palestinians inside occupied territory. The second intifada was led by Yasser Arafat himself and the PA. This intifada is leaderless. This is groups of frustrated people who, have, who cannot see a political horizon, who are carrying arms and, and shooting at random without a political objective necessarily. And that makes this third intifada more difficult to deal with. You don't know who to talk to. You don't know who to talk to. That's the situation we are in today. And I'm, again, I'm sorry to be, it's, it's, you know, in politics, there's no pessimism or optimism. But you have to be realistic about the, the, the options. And realistically, realistically, Unless there is a, a sustained uh, a, a effort by the, by the international community to force Israel to end the occupation, this occupation is not going to end, and therefore the two-state solution is over. So, Nasif, uh, uh, again, we're back to the two-state solution is, is over. Is over because, I guess, if I understood well, violence may erupt. It will be uh, a cruder violence this time. It will be an anarchical violence, with not organized, without leaders. Uh, so, how how to deal with the, with the with the situation? Does this mean that uh, we should expect violence to be extended in the region and to be expanded uh, in the region in the next five, six, seven, ten years? Uh, will if the region if the region can bear that, can the international system? Bear this, can they, because after all, the region is a sub-region, is a subsystem of the international system. How can the international system live on with violence continuing and expanding and extending in the region? What do you think? Uh, sorry, I mean, we learned the first year of political science and the course on negotiations. You don't leave the kitchen unless you feel the heat in the kitchen. So basically, it's not a matter of Mother Teresa approach, be nice and, and find a solution. Israel cannot impose its own solution. It could deny to the Palestinians and whoever support them changing the situation. Palestinians cannot impose their solutions. Here, an external actor, like my colleagues mentioned about it, a role of, I don't like the concept of international community, uh, call it key international uh, actors, uh, key powers in the system, and not only the US. We had the, we committed in the past a huge mistake by putting, by believing that 99% of the cards are in the hands of the Americans, yes, which were offered to the Israelis on the other side. Uh, you have to make them feel, whatever they feel, that everybody has an interest in a, in a, in a solution based, based on that matter, which remains acceptable. Now, this schizophrenia of saying we are for a Palestinian state, but we don't recognize the Palestinian state, I fully agree with my friends. We have to start recognizing bilaterally a Palestinian state, deal with it as such within the borders as 
you know, uh, has been witnessed and decided by the UN Security Council's pertinent resolutions and move on from there. It's a long process, it's an uphill struggle, it's not easy. But what's dangerous today, as we could see today, in the past, all conflicts around the Palestinian issue would be limited to what we call the confrontation state. Some of them are not in a state of, of confrontation at one point of time, some other were in a state of confrontation. Today, these issues are being, this case is being instrumentalized not necessarily for this case, as we see now in the Babel Mandib and the Red Sea, as we see what's going on in Iraq, it's a war by proxy. It's a war by proxy for different reasons, but using a very attractive issue, which is a Palestinian issue. You can mobilize around it, it's an identity-based issue. And we all know that in history, not only for Palestinians or in the Middle East, identity issues cannot be destroyed. You could suppress them for years, decades, whatever it is, but they could come back. They could be misused, instrumentalized, but they could come back. Of course, the current military balance of power would not allow such a solution, but also the current military balance of power cannot impose the Israeli version of such a solution that Rush mentioned before is extremely dangerous, as I say, and I say it, if you invite God into the conflict for, for different reasons as it's happened. Sometimes on the Arab side we are accused, or the, on the Muslim side, but now it's being used officially by, by, uh, uh, by Israel. What we see, what I see myself, is a prolongation of the war it's a protracted conflict with ups and downs. Perhaps over time, some rules of, of conduct, uh, of managing crisis, as you've seen it in Lebanon, will develop rules of engagement. But this will be buying time later on for a bigger, more dangerous, more complex explosion that touches everybody's interest, whether on from the Mediterranean to the Gulf region. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Nasif. I'll, I'll, I'll ask. Uh, Nabil Fahmi, uh, Nabil, each, each and every country, if you take Lebanon, Jordan, uh, uh, Egypt, when, when it has to confront a question related to Palestine, Gaza, and this, uh, the, there are the immediate interests of the concerned country, and there are the questions related to the entire Arab region. And Nasif, I just mentioned the question of identity that you can forget about for some time, but it always, uh, it always, it always come back. So, and I guess the two, the two perspectives and the two are, are interlinked. You cannot dissociate uh, uh, Lebanon from the region where it lives and Jordan the same and Egypt. So, how, what do you think about this linkage between the very specific Egyptian perspective of preserving its own sport national interest and, and Jordan's and Lebanon and the, the more general picture of, of the region where, where they live and of the identity that, that they share. Thank you. That's a great question. The reality is every, every Arab country in the region, when faced with a problem of the magnitude and the nature of the Palestinian problem, but also with the level of violence we're seeing now, is faced with, on the one hand, its own national interest, but on the other hand, also how it affects the region as a whole. And Thirdly, it's on credibility. And let me try to explain simply. Uh, from Egypt's foreign policy, we look at ourselves, besides being Egyptian, as a leader in the Arab world. If the Arab world is unstable or disintegrates, then our national interest will be affected. So even from farther away, if the Arab world is provoked and there are higher trends of anger and violence. It affects our national interests, and I'll give you a simple example of the Red Sea. What's happening in the Red Sea has brought down returns in the Suez Canal 50%. So that's affected our national interests directly. But more so, uh, people tend to, let me, let me deal with the Rafah issue specifically. People tend to simplify our position a little bit 
by saying that we don't want to let in the refugees because of our concerns about security. That's the third, if not the fourth, concern. The first concern is we will not participate in the process where you dilute the Palestinian identity from the Palestinian territories. That's not something we will be part of in any way. So that's the first point of resistance. It's not securing the Sinai. It's like, the Sinai is a challenge always, but we can handle that. The second point, frankly, and we may be very close to that in the next couple of days, is we have a process of basic humanity. If the Palestinians are pushed towards the border and you have Israeli gunfire on the one side, what do we do? Simply say, no, as long as you're on the other side of the border, you're not human beings, and we won't respond to that. So on the one hand, there is the political issue vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. On the other hand, this is actually a serious uh, issue that is being dealt with every hour on the hour now in our own terms. And thirdly, if we see Israel doing this intentionally and consequently affecting our border, consequently affecting our national security, then they are in violation of the peace agreement between Egypt and Israel. Now, we don't want to go to war with Israel. We were the first to, to, to sign a peace agreement with the Israelis, and that remains our position. But the idea that uh, we will allow our borders to be insecure is not on the table. So every one of these have consequences. Discussions we've had today, uh, if you start forcibly displacing Palestinians across Palestinian, Egyptian borders or into Jordanian borders, that's going to affect both agreements. And I think the, correct me if I'm wrong, the, uh, the, the Jordanian foreign minister has openly said that that would affect the peace agreement with Israel. So you're going down a path where... It would be a declaration of war. I know, exactly. Uh, so you're going down towards a region that's becoming much more unstable. Well, if it's much more unstable, that affects my national security. So it's not an emotional issue. It's not a small problem. Uh, and frankly, I would also add to that, don't play into people's fears. If you play into their fears, they have no way to look forward towards hope and have no way to exercise self-defense, they will become violent against individuals. And don't misunderstand me. I spent over 30 years in diplomacy, and I saw it on both sides. I do not equate the occupier with the occupied. But if you don't have a, 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 a basic way to try to solve the problem, don't be surprised, as Marwan said, don't be surprised that there will be violence. There will be more violence. And that affects my national security in the ways I explained. And it also, frankly, affects uh, our goals. We want to pursue a region that is at peace with each other. Anything else is detrimental to this, to this process. But I'm really worried about, I know that a two-state solution is very difficult to do, especially in the short term, but it should be the clear ob object, ob objective. But I, I also believe that the one-state solution, or the one-state reality, is almost impossible to do peacefully in the short term. Uh, and I really would argue that it's better to try as hard as you can towards a solution that's concrete than to decide, okay, we can't solve this, which may be the, the, tr the truth, uh, so let's just leave it to the, to the people on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side to solve their problems because this will end up exploding in everybody's face. Thank you very much, Nabil. And, and I'd like you started the Tahrir dialogues, and you know that we leave room for the audience to to raise uh, some questions, and we only have 15 minutes. But I don't want to to 
open the floor before uh, asking you to comment in 30 seconds each. We've been talking for 45 minutes and Hamas was not mentioned at all. Uh, to me, Hamas is the product of the conflict and is not the origin of the conflict. Hamas is a consequence of the conflict and it's not the organization that created it. You agree with that? In 30 seconds. I, I, even in less than 30 seconds, and it, it's not a diplomatic answer, but actually uh, the one I really believe in. We should focus on how do we solve this problem, not who is the source or not the source of the problem. I have my own opinion on who is the source, and I think my comments have been clear about that. But we cannot afford to allow Palestinians to suffer more because we bl blame the other side, and we cannot solve this problem unless we find some action plan. And I underline again, it's not about hopes and aspirations. There has to be a clear, annotated set of, of targets which are linked under an umbrella. And let me close by one point. People keep mentioning this idea that they can't recognize the Palestinian state because there's no border yet. Well, Israel doesn't have a border. It doesn't have a map. Israel, Israeli borders are the borders of their neighboring states. They don't have a map. They recognize Israel, which is fine with me. But if you support the Palestinian right to, to having national identity, then you have to be able to give them hope to move forward. And I think if we do, our challenge will not be in convincing the Palestinians and Israelis to, to achieve peace. It will be actually trying to convince the Israelis more to agree. The Palestinians are ready. They're angry, they're frustrated, but they're much more ready to, to move forward than what we're seeing on the Israeli side. 30 seconds, please, uh, on, on Hamas. And the, uh, the IRA in Ireland was deemed a terrorist organization by the world until there was a solution to the problem of Northern Ireland, and they became a political force. Organizations become political forces. You cannot say, I'm not going to deal with Hamas, when 60% of Palestinians want Hamas to come to Gaza, when 43% of any elections, according to the latest poll, are, are going to win by Hamas. You cannot ignore Hamas. Whether we agree with them or not is not the issue. The issue is, if you want Hamas to be a political force, put a solution forward. But we cannot not put a solution forward and then expect people to be peaceful. That doesn't work. Thank you very much, Asif. Absolutely agree. If you want to de-radicalize uh, politically, organizationally, and logically a situation, you have to create a serious, tangible, uh, clear road or path to peace. That's the only way to do it. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Uh, I think we, we, we have time for two or three questions. Very, very, if you can raise a question very quickly. Uh, I, I, I will start, Professor Corrin. Okay. No, uh, uh, I want to know, what do you think the role of the Gulf countries can be? Here, here for that. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. What do you think the role of the Gulf countries can be to improve the situation? Of course, the, the Gulf countries are not a monolithic term, first of all. I mean, they don't have a unified position on, on this. The, the Saudis and the Emiratis are, have a different positions than the Kuwaitis or the Omanis. But, but putting that aside, the Arab world is not where it used to be. Unfortunately, the last time the Arab world had a unified position on the peace process uh, is with the Arab Peace Initiative. That was 22 years ago, and the world has changed since then. I think the Saudis can play a useful role if they want to. The question is, do they want to? The Saudis today are in negotiations with the United States over an agreement with Israel. Okay, They want 
normalization with Israel, but their demands are from the United States, not from Israel. And there are three demands, basically. In, in a peaceful nuclear program, a defense treaty, and advanced weaponry. There are many Democrats on the Hill that don't want to give the Saudis a defense treaty with the United States because of you know, problems having to do with human rights, etc., in Saudi Arabia. Sorry? Khashoggi and, and others, not just Khashoggi. I heard it from several Democratic senators, myself. They said the only way, the only way we would change our mind on agreeing to a defense treaty with Saudi Arabia is if there is something serious on the peace process. That is, if the agreement has something serious, not something nominal, okay, not, not re rhetoric, but something serious on the peace process, it might cause us to change our mind. That's a very, to me, a very small glim you know, glimmer of hope. Are the Saudis interested in putting that something serious? Are the Americans interested in you know, going that far? I don't have the answer to that. But absent that, absent that, I'm not sure the Gulf countries are going to help find a solution to, to the Palestinian issue. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Khalil Bagat? Uh, this is indeed a very distinguished panel. People who have been practicing politics and not only talking about it or teaching it. And I'll start by a factual remark and then my question to each of you. The factual remark, we haven't seen in history a country that has been committing so many atrocities without any reaction from the global order. No sanctions, with the exception of South Africa and the International Court of Justice. Practically, you as practitioners, what would each of you, given the limitations that Nabil has been talking about, national interest and all of that, if you were in the foreign ministry, what actions would you have suggested to take to force that single country to change course? Thank you, Raghat. Uh, uh, we have seven minutes, so I will start with Nasif. Nasif, uh, please, in, in a couple of minutes. L less than that. The problem, actually, dear Rajat, is what we call selective morality at the international level. The double standard selective morality at the international level. What to do, what to do about that? I mentioned it, as we say, in passant, at the beginning. If you don't invest your capacities, all your capacities, all your power to serve your goals, so you go nowhere. And, I think it's not a matter of doing a Maratha approach to do that in the region. It's in the interest of everybody in the region to have serious, genuine uh, stability, to conservate stability. And unless we address this issue, as I mentioned before, and I mentioned it times and times all the time, this is an issue that could be instrumentalized for other matters because it's an attractive issue. It's a no legitimacy issue. Thank you. Thank you, Bagat. Yes, at the beginning I said one point that's paramount in any package is accountability. Unless we hold the, the states of the region accountable, we will end up allowing for what we've seen to be, happen again and again. Uh, what we would do, uh, first of all, I would speak more clearly, publicly. Secondly, I would convey the positions that I intend to take if actions continue to get worse and worse to the, the parties directly involved. Thirdly, I would do the same and convey the same positions to the permanent members of the Security Council. In, all, in other words, it should be very, very clear that in these circumstances, country, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, whatever the country is, will take actions one, two, three, and four. Uh, and we're telling you a priori, not by way of a threat, 
but by way of what is the legitimate, logical position to be taken by a country at peace who wants peace for the whole reason. The other point I'd make, frankly, uh, one, one, one final point here before one, my last comment. What I say has to be witnessed on the ground. What I say has to be reflected on the ground so that people understand that what I'm saying is credible. Uh, my, the point I'd like to make also is, frankly, there are so many states that are, are pursuing policies inconsistent with their own laws. The Dutch courts just issued a decision yesterday or the day before that Holland could not continue to provide weapons to Israel because that's inconsistent with the International Court of Justice uh, uh, resolution. To my American friends here, the Ley legislation does not allow you to export weapons to countries which use them against civilians. These aren't being used against civilians, and nobody is raising a flag here. I would raise these issues, and I would frankly would not only talk to governments, but I also talk to all of the NGO, legal, human rights, uh, you name it, organizations, public opinion. Okay, we're trying to solve this, and we're not against anybody. Again, I, I have no hesitation raising these points because I'm not worried about being accused of being anti-peace. We did it before any of you guys thought it was possible. So we have credibility on this. But you cannot argue you want peace and security and you want rule of law, but I'm going to violate my own law to allow a country to continue to, to kill civilians, uh, and I'm against a ceasefire, and I can go on and on. So again, uh, my national actions should be public, conveyed to the parties concerned, all of them, and to the permanent members, and they should be reflected on the ground. I won't get into the details of how. Much. Uh, uh, I'd like you to 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 also, reply, but I'd like to deal with one issue in in, in half a minute. Nabil has just uh, uh, talked about civil society and global civil society, and you have seen global civil society move this this time around, organize and 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 uh, stage marches and and events and using ICT technology. Do you think that global civil society also can weigh on how the future of the region is configured? Well, frankly, civil society globally has been more active than, than governments in this region. I mean, we've seen the demonstrations in the West, and they far uh, have, are, are larger than any demonstrations we've seen here. Uh, civil society can also if there is one action to be taken, can strongly support the case against Israel by South Africa. This is a very, very important uh, point in my view. Yes, the, 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 the court uh, did not uh, rule uh, directly in favor of stopping the war, but the very fact that the war said there is plausible evidence, plausible cause, for Israel to be tried in the highest court of the, of the universe for genocide crimes is important because it undermines the Israeli argument, one, that it is defending itself, two, that it is the only democracy in the Middle East. What, how can Israel keep saying that when it is being accused of the highest form, or maybe the lowest form, of criminal activity in the world. There is no, no crime bigger than genocide in the world. And so I think it is the responsibility of governments, but also of civil society, to strongly support this case, because Israel will have now to defend itself, not politically, but legally, for years to come, 
and prove that it did not commit suicide, we have the responsibility to legally prove that it is committing suicide, uh, genocide. genocide. Well, it is committing suicide too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, thank you very much. We have come to the end. In fact, it's uh, uh, 8, 8 p.m. sharp. And uh, this was planned to end at 8 p.m. sharp. So I, I, I thank the, the, the three panelists uh, for the great idea. In fact, it's been under the, uh, a number of years, Nabil, that we haven't had this public in a Tahir dialogue. In a number of years, uh, uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, and, and I think that that events and the gravity of events uh, raise the interests of of people, raise the interests of people, and attract them to serious panels, serious discussions. We had these, you remember Nabil, 10 years ago, over 10 years ago. Uh, the, the people are back, people are back, so let's hope that we'll return again and again and again and again. Thank you very much to Marwan Lamash, Nabil Fahmi, Nasif Hatti, and to the, uh, all those present, uh, those present here. Thank you very much for making us honor. Thank you.